call. I just want to uh, welcome you all to this conversation about the Our Power Puerto Rico campaign, um, really a case study and framework for just recovery that we have several folks who work directly on this campaign with us today presenting. Um, and we're really excited at the lab to be doing this in partnership with the Climate Justice Alliance. A uh, couple things just to get us started. I wanted to share with folks a trail map of where we're headed. So uh, this is the opening and welcome section. Um, I'll be doing a little bit of orienting you to today's webinar and then passing the mic over to Angela from the Climate Justice Alliance for a little bit more of a welcome. Um, that will be followed by an introduction to just recovery from Joisha. Um, Jesus is gonna be talking to us a little bit about just recovery response in Puerto Rico. Uh, Shakar will be talking about solidarity brigades and process, the solidarity process. And then Elizabeth will be talking specifically about the Our Power Puerto Rico campaign um, before we do a Q&A and a closing. Um, and just really excited to have these folks with us today. This presentation is actually the culmination of a collaboration of sorts between the lab and CJA. So we're really excited um, to be able to share that with you today. And just by way of sharing a little bit more of a background for those who are not familiar with the Climate Advocacy Lab, um, we are a movement support organization that focuses on helping the climate community build grassroots power and win through evidence-based advocacy. And our work falls into four major buckets. The first is our awesome members. So we support about 2,500 climate practitioners, organizers, funders, activists, et cetera, um, across the movement uh, through the resources and programming we offer. And if you're interested in becoming a member of the lab, it's free. And if you're in the climate space, you can email us info at climateadvocacylab.org to request to be a member. Um, and then we deliver support in the form of workshops and webinars, um, what evidence suggests and what we've learned from the field about what's working and what's not to engage folks um, on climate and to build meaningful political power. We also support a lot of research and field testing. So really helping the movement uh, answer the questions like why are you doing what you're doing on issues related to climate? And importantly, how do you know that it's working uh, so that we make sure that we're all working smarter, not just harder. And last but not least, we have an online platform full of interactive tools, resources, et cetera. And if folks are interested in having full access to those resources, again, please join the lab. As I mentioned, uh, today's conversation is really highlighting a collaboration between CJA and the lab that culminated in this multimedia report that's available online. And we'll drop into the chat box the link to this report. Um, but a lot of different resources that are available to you all about what was learned through the Our Power Puerto Rico campaign and the work that was done in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria and others, um, other hurricanes uh, to move really toward a just recovery. So we're excited about not only introducing some frameworks to you from that work, but really having here with us today folks who are on the ground doing the work um, immediately after this disaster in Puerto Rico. So um, thank you to CJA for all of your incredible work. Thanks to the speakers for being with us today. And uh, Angela, I will pass it to you for a little bit more of a welcome. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, so excited to participate and see Critical Mass. Um, I'm also just honored to be the Executive Director of the Climate Justice Alliance and see so many of our leaders on this webinar. We have steering committee members, we have leads on our food sovereignty working group, um, lead staff members, um, and lead members who have been uh, critical in just recovery and just transition overall. So thank you so much for joining us. There's gonna be rich, rich conversation um, that comes out of the report itself. But I wanted us to start, if we could, with a moment of silence for all our ancestors um, um, and all those that became ancestors because of climate disasters all over the world and which uh, we owe showing and sharing climate solutions in any way that we can possibly and learning from um, and, and continuing the struggle that we're all a part of. So if we could just take one minute before we begin to take a deep breath and honor those um, that came before us and that, um, that um, our ancestors because of climate disaster. Thank you so much. Um, 
So CJ, for those that, that, that may not know of us, is um, an alliance that does three main things. Basically, we make Just Transition real on the ground, moving multiple sectors to make that happen, focusing on local living economies. Uh, we also move the money through reinvestment strategies, divestment strategies, um, funder organizing strategies with philanthropy and other um, sectors. And then we also um, center the and center the influence of frontline communities. So we make sure frontline communities are part of the knowledge sharing that happens at the national level, at the international level. And as we speak, you'll see some of our speakers are calling from the COP, are calling from multiple um, regions of the United States, are calling from multiple um, areas within um, Turtle Island. Um, and so the just recovery work that you will see featured in this webinar, and that is part of what was communicated in the report comes directly out of the just transition work that we do to address the root causes of climate and also challenge the disgraceful degenerative practices of disaster capitalism that make mega millions uh, from the common families and the people suffering and dying from climate change. And so this report and the way it was written and you'll hear more about it was written uh, by those most impacted in those communities um, to share and communicate with those that will be most impacted. And so this is very much a working practical tool um, and not a report that sits on the shelf. Um, through the report, you'll see we've addressed mitigation, adaptation, we've addressed how and why it's important to reduce emissions, the effects of community impacts, multiple polluting industries, we've talked about extractive industries and all of that has happened, you know, focusing on like the sector of energy, focus on the intersections of food sovereignty, transportation, health, um, the importance of activating politically in moments of just recovery. And the beauty of the report is that we were able to do that. And those authors that are here with you now, were able to do that in a common language, right? In a way that felt really practical, in a way that people could pick up that report and actually say, hey, this is really useful for us as a community. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed to the transformative life-changing experience it's been to engage in just recovery. Um, you know, just getting on to prepare for this felt really emotional about like what it meant to build a report from the actual experience and to recognize not, you know, not especially just the authors and the organizers and the Puerto Rican people, those in the Caribbean islands and the Gulf Coast, the diaspora, for all that they've contributed and continue to contribute to our collective learning around survival, around solutions, around mutual support for not just the regenerative economy, which is what we're really committed to as the Climate Justice Alliance, but for regenerative relationships in times of conflict and in times of climate disaster. Um, and we do that with a, um, a strong commitment to Mother Earth and to each other. And so you uh, will be hearing from everyone shortly, but I wanted to pass um, the mic over to Joisha, who's um, definitely one of the folks who started us off in this Just, just re Recovery journey. Thank you so much, Joisha. And Joisha, you are on mute. So if you could unmute yourself, we'll be able to hear you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay, that's great. All right. Um, hello, y'all. I am, my name is Joysha. This is Loading. Um, I'm actually here in Puerto Rico right now. Uh, my compa Jesus is actually in Madrid, but I'm here in Puerto Rico. Um, and I'm going to just share a little bit about kind of the genesis of the term just recovery and Kind of where it came from and then you know Jesus will go much more into kind of Puerto Rico um, and so you know we're going back to the 2017 hurricane season I live in New Orleans I'm part of a collective of women across the Gulf South called another Gulf is possible and as Hurricane Harvey was coming to uh, the Gulf Coast you know we had the kind of typical reaction that we have anytime a hurricane is coming I live in a place which suffered you know, enormous devastation from Hurricane Katrina. And there is a post-traumatic stress of people in reaction to a hurricane anytime it's coming. And so in August of 2017, when that hurricane was coming, I'm part of a wide, you know, network of, you know, veteran organizers across the Gulf Coast who, you know, as soon as we knew this hurricane was coming, we didn't know if it was going to Houston, we didn't know if it was going to New Orleans. We 
decided to start jumping on calls and these calls to um, figure out how we were going to support each other because we know time and time again that the government does not do what they need to do. And so from that, from these calls, we were like, well, we need some kind of hashtag. Um, and we need a hashtag that will kind of build a narrative around a different kind of recovery because we already knew this was going to be a big hurricane. We didn't know the extent of the devastation that the flooding would have um, on Houston, but we, we decided to use a just recovery as a hashtag. Um, I volunteered at that moment, had some capacity to put together a website on our page to connect regional resources and the mobilization supports that were happening. That page went very viral. On the bottom of the slide, you'll see um, that one web page went to trying to identify places other than the Red Cross. Um, knowing FEMA would take a really long time. That was kind of the, the moment at which that term just recovery started getting used and I wanted to highlight and uplift my um, dear friend, brother and uh, organizing companion, Brian Fadas in you know, a lot of the work he did in that moment to kind of mobilize his community um, in getting the support that his community needed in that moment. Um, a few weeks later, I actually went to Cuba for what was supposed to be a trip to learn salsa and get my Spanish better. It ended up actually being a huge lesson in what kind of recovery and response can happen in a hurricane in a place that is built for supporting communities during a hurricane. And this ended up being one of the worst hurricanes that has ever come across the planet in this side of the world. It was a category five when it hit Cuba. Yet on Friday afternoon, when I was, you know, expecting everyone going crazy, because that's how people are in my community every time a hurricane, everyone was super chill, super mellow. And I'm like, there's a hurricane coming. There's guys are like, I'm getting, anytime I got on the internet, I'd be getting texts of people like really worried about me. They're like, don't worry, no worry, no worry, everything's gonna be fine. And sure enough, four o'clock, you see everybody just going into response mode, shutting, you know, shutting down the, the hatches basically to, to weather the storm. When the storm came, the brigades went out. There was a little bit of loss of life, but for me, that experience and seeing how the Cuban people dealt with it was a huge lesson in a, a different way, another way of being, another way that we can, you know, respond to these hurricanes. And the people in the Caribbean, time and time again, have had to, and Cuba in particular has developed a very low resource mutual aid way of responding that is government supported. So I really wanted to bring personal joy, you know, being what happened in Houston didn't people care of the people and just the people's just feeling like they were going to be taken care of. Um, then we know that a couple, you know, just a few days after that, you know, Puerto Rico was so um, Jenny, sorry, this is Lucia. Just wanted to jump in for a second. Your sound um, directly, but Maria did come directly. Yeah. Jaisha, your sound is cutting out a lot. And I'm wondering if you might just turn off your video in the bottom left of your screen so that there's um, less pressure on your connection that might help with your sound. Well, it's, we'd still be able to see your screen share, just not your video of your face. I know. I'm going to stop the share then. Um, okay, yeah. You're, if you turn off your video of your face, we should be able to still see the presentation. Um, yeah, if you want to try that, let's give that a shot. I think it's helping. Is that helping? Yeah. I, I don't know what y'all heard, what y'all didn't hear, so sorry. The most important part is what I'm about to say, so that's fine. Um, you missed my personal story if you didn't hear what I was saying, and I am in a place where, you know, internet connection is a little challenging in Puerto Rico. So, um, so you know, basically those experiences that I don't know what you heard and what you didn't hear, um, led to this idea of, you know, how do we move from climate disasters that time and time again have resulted in 
you know, the status quo where there is immediate aid provided by these national NGOs and government in a really, you know, not very good way to, uh, sorry, I'm getting texts, um, from the Red Cross, Catholic Charities, United Way, FEMA, these places that we know do not actually support or provide the kind of infrastructure to the communities that we, I know at CJA, are the most committed to supporting that are our communities. And after that immediate aid is provided, there's an extraction process that happens. I've seen it in my city. I'm seeing it very, very clearly here on this island where the extraction of land and labor happens from the vulnerable communities who are hit by these disasters and then a long-term displacement, which again, this island, New Orleans, we see hundreds of thousands of people being displaced. And then we see venture capitalists, all this capitalist money coming to take over the communities. In you know, comparison to that, there is another way and that's you know, what we are talking about when we talk about Just Recovery, where we can respond with mutual support networks. We can recover providing the resources and support that's necessary to get folks working, to get them back into their homes, and to get them to rebuild their communities, ideally in a way where they're stronger than they were, and they're not hot, as vulnerable as they were the next time a hurricane happens. Because what we do know as climate change continues to devastate our world, is that these disasters are only going to get worse and we need to figure out the ways that the right side of this diagram can really be um, emphasized and highlighted. And so I'm going to pass it to Jesus in a moment because I know my time is almost up, but I wanted to bring one uh, particular strategy I don't think will be discussed much in this conversation today, but that one just recovery strategy that you might not think about is supporting artists and supporting art spaces in moments of like disaster and before moments of disaster. Because oftentimes artists are people who have networks, informal and formal networks in communities, and those spaces can be used as distribution points. Those spaces can be used as places for all sorts of healing that is needed during times of disaster. So a just recovery strategy that might not be something you think of immediately is supporting artists as first responders. So I'm going to stop my share and pass it to Brother Jesus. Thank you so much, Jaisha. And I just wanted to mention that we did catch most of your story, and this gave us an opportunity to see the lovely picture of you on your Zoom profile. Um, so thank you for that. Jesus. OK. Um, hello, everybody. And, and thank you, Joisha. Um, if, if, if I have problems with my audio, please feel free to interrupt me immediately and we'll, and we'll deal like we, like we did now. Okay, so yeah, hello everybody. Um, this is Jesus. I'm um, in Madrid, Spain right now. Um, the official UN Conference of Climate Change is happening here after it was taken from the people of Chile uh, because of the heroic struggle that the people are doing there. And uh, we, as uh, the Climate Justice Alliance, the It Takes Roots family, and La Via Campesina, we have a common strategy, right? We have folks that are in Chile right now showing that solidarity from people to people. And also we have some folks here doing what we have to do at the social summit, at the conference, but also at the streets. And this is what it's all about when we're talking about just recovery, just transition, food sovereignty is the way we work, is, 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 is talking and, and, and practicing these real solutions. And I'm gonna share my screen real quick now and share and put the presentation. Okay, and now. Looking good. Looking good, now present. Perfect. Okay, so, all right. So we're here to talk about our power, Puerto Rico, and the speakers that we, that we are here uh, had a lot to do with this process. And, uh, and uh, our power, Puerto Rico, um, was a process that, um, that, that we organized along the Climate Justice Alliance, Organización Boricua, uh, which is the organization that I'm part of, and, um, and, and, um, and other communities, um, to, to do what uh, Joisha was talking about, to practice just recovery, right? And, um, and uh, just that just recovery uh, came with uh, people and organizations that we already had a relationship. So it's very important to highlight uh, that in moments of needs, there's a lot of people that come uh, and say that they're going to help you, right? So it is important uh, for us as, as, as communities, as, as, as collectives, especially in the global south, to be aware and to, and to work within a framework that really 
uh, defines us and that really um, visibilize our struggles and, and identities. So uh, Organización Boricua is a national organization, a national platform. Uh, this year we are in our 30 year anniversary and, and our organization is composed by farmers, by hilaros, uh, peasants. Uh, hilaros is the word that we use in Puerto Rico for, for campesino and uh, farm workers and also food sovereignty activists. And uh, we are people that are coming from the rural areas, from coastal areas, and also from urban communities. Uh, we work in, within, uh, in the, as, uh, with a decentralized uh, methodology. We're also uh, multi-regional. We have people in the mountain region. We have people in the south. We have people in other islands that are also part of Puerto Rico, like Vieques and Culebra. And we work uh, with an intergenerational approach, right? And, um, and we have a network of farms, farm schools, and different projects in Puerto Rico that are promoting and practicing agroecology as a vehicle to achieve uh, food sovereignty. And uh, as I mentioned before, our organization is, is part of La Via Campesina and also the Climate Justice Alliance. This is a little picture that we took a few weeks ago when we had a, one of the farmers' uh, uh, dialogues in, uh, in the town of Orocovis. And, uh, and that's a little bit of, of some of our members that are in, in, in that picture. And uh, I, we thought it was important uh, to talk a little bit about the context and history of Puerto Rico before we, we, we get into what we did within this, um, our power process. And uh, for us, it is important to highlight that uh, in Puerto Rico before 1493, for centuries, we had the Taino people. Actually, our organization's name, Organización Boricua, comes from Boriquen, which is the indigenous Taino name of our island. And we treasure that identity. Uh, we treasure our African descent identity. And that has a lot to do with what, 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 what we are as people. And uh, you know, colonialism through the Spanish colonial period and also the US colonial period has, a, has done a lot to do to try to erase that. So for us, it is very important to highlight that. In 1493, uh, it started the Spanish colonization. 1868, we had the Grito de Lares insurrection. There has been always people in Puerto Rico resisting. There has been always people in Puerto Rico organized. And there has been always people in Puerto Rico struggling for, for freedom and liberation. Um, um, we had, uh, in 1898, we had the US uh, invade Puerto Rico. And uh, in 1920, we had the Jones Act. It's very important to talk about the Jones Act within the Puerto Rico because um, this is an, an act that, um, that makes uh, Puerto Rico receive all of, of, of its food and, 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 and items and, and anything that, that we need that comes imported um, through, through US vessels. And that is a problem. I'm pretty sure we're gonna talk about that. And then we became a, a commonwealth. Uh, that's what we are right now, Estado Libre Asociado. And we have a long uh, history of experimentation um, with, um, with uh, Agent Orange. Uh, we had um, um, many, uh, the US has used us as a laboratory. So we are reacting, we've been organizing to, to struggle and battle for that. And, uh, and important recently, we had Promesa Bill 2016, 2017, we have Hurricane Irma and Maria, and recently 2019, this year, uh, the people made uh, Ricardo Rosselló a corrupt uh, governor and a corrupt uh, team of, of people that were governing uh, go out. Um, and, uh, and so for us, that is very important. Okay, so um, in Puerto Rico, we have a, a, a graphic here that talks about um, our situation, our vulnerability when it, when it comes to food. Uh, from, uh, according to some research, 80 to 85% of our food comes from abroad, uh, comes imported, and it comes in US uh, vessels, and uh, the food that we consume as, as Puerto Ricans. This is a little graphic where we can see how it, it has increased that. Um, and the orange, uh, we've seen how it has gone low. So the green signifies the amount of food that comes from abroad and the orange is the amount of food that we produce. And also we have a, a GMO industry that is present on, on our island that is affecting many communities and, uh, and affecting also what we try to do with agriculture. Um, we work with uh, food sovereignty, um, and food sovereignty is, is no other thing that, um, um, that, uh, that the food system needs to be in, in the hands of the people and not in the hands of a few multinationals. 
And uh, how do we build this, this food sovereignty? We build it through agroecology. And agroecology has been trending. It has been sounding a lot, even in these UN spaces. And for us, that is very important. But we want to highlight that agroecology is just the way that we've been producing food for centuries. It's culture and technology that comes from our ancestors. It can provide food in abundance. It can provide food in harmony with Mother Nature. And, uh, and that's the type of, of agricultural model that we support, that we practice, and we're all about scaling up and scaling out that, that, that method uh, within all of the people and the farmers um, in our organization. Um, Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Maria happened 2017. It was a, 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 a category five hurricane that devastated our islands. This is a few pictures that we can see like a monoculture of, of of plantain to the left and, and some of the impacts that, that Maria had in our, in, our, in our landscape. Also, we had a uh, few weeks before we had Hurricane Irma that also uh, um, did some damage and also left many people without basic necessities. So our context uh, during Hurricane Maria, we, we, we didn't have access to, to basic necessities like electricity, communications, etc. We had a US military presence in Puerto Rico. We had most of our agriculture activity gone, and we had a government that was lying, that was saying that only uh, 51 people uh, died, when at the end we know, know because of the research and, and, the, and, the, and the reporters that 3,000 people died in this process. And uh, we had immigration, approximately 55,000 people left the island. And, um, and uh, what do we do? We do um, brigades within Organización Baricua. Boricua was founded through a process of mutual support. How do we help each other? And the, this space provided a, a, a learning process where we knew when the hurricane happened, where were our people? Where were the people that could be most in need? So we knew how to act, but at the same time, we had our allies. We have our other organizations, the Puerto Ricans in the diaspora, like Uprose, Elizabeth is going to talk a little bit about that, that were there for us. When nobody was there for us, it was a process where people solved their own issues and organized people could also help other people and communities that were in help. And it was, a, uh, it, even though it brought a lot of bad, it was a school for us. And, um, and, um, and here's a little um, uh, graphic that we had in terms of how brigades are, and how do, does the government uh, responded to these, uh, to these contexts and how do we uh, respond with our degrees, with our brigades, for example, centralizing versus decentralizing, et cetera. And you can check all this out in our report. And finally, these are just a few pictures that I'm just gonna scroll um, up down with. This is a process of what do we did during that process with the Climate Justice Alliance, with folks from La Via Campesina, from Black Dirt Farm Collective, working in, in, in many of our farms together and uh, rebuilding farming infrastructure, rebuilding farmers' houses, and replanting uh, the farms to, provide, to keep providing food for, for our communities. We also went to St. Croix, some islands that were less visible, and do this help. And it was a, a month long process and it was a very hard process where all of the participants here were there, but it is the process that we treasure and what, what, and, and what we say when we talk about true and just solutions. And I'm gonna pass it now to my friend uh, Shakira from the Black Dirt Farm Collective, who was a key person in all of this process. Thank you. Thanks, Jesus. And if you can just stop your screen share, we'll transfer it over. Um, and as we go through this transition, if folks have questions that are coming up that you want to drop in the chat, we'll start um, keeping track of them and developing a stack for our Q&A. Then hi, everyone. Okay. Looks right, good. Okay. Um, so I'm representing, I'm Shakira, and I'm representing the Black Dirt Farm Collective, and we're a young, a group of mostly young Black agrarian folks who identify with the repeasantization process um, of people returning to rural communities to live a life rooted in sustainable principles. And we facilitate agroecology encounters and brigades um, in the U.S. mainly, which we pull from the campesino a campesino or peasant to peasant methodology um where the horizontal knowledge exchanges really are forefronted in quest for 
political, ecological, and social transformations. Um, and that's how we actually became connected to Boricua um, over about five years ago. And we've been engaging in deep learning together, um, sharing political space and cultural traditions since we, since we met. Um, we've, we've been to Puerto Rico a few times, participating in Boricua's uh, brigades and encounters. And that's how that's informed our methodology here um, on Turtle Island and how we do agroecology encounters and brigades. Um, and so our pre-existing relationships enabled us to uh, form the political coordination team for the International Solidarity Brigade that Jesus spoke of um, with less complications and more um, synergy. And that has really laid the foundation for the solidarity processes that came after, after that. Um, and so one of the most important ways we build solidarity is through doing meaningful, meaningful work together with each other. Um, that can be felt with our heads, our hands, and our hearts. And the brigade was such a phenomenal experience um, for everyone because we did everything together. We cooked, we cleaned, we farmed, we built physical structures together. Um, and, and that's why I participated in the International Solidarity Brigade. And because it, it was about building political power. And we know that in times of climate crisis and the growing fascism, um, it's important that we forefront meaningful work, not work that we can you know, get paid for, or it's like a simple nine to five, but meaningful work that will lead to um, liberated realities for all of us. Um, and so the brigade demonstrated how hard and important the work is and how our survival depends on us building relationships, trust, and mutual accountability with one another. Um, and so that's what agroecology is. Within um, La Vie Campesina, the Black Dairy Farm Collective methodology, the Boricua methodology, we know that agroecology is not just about regenerative farming methods or growing food in communion with, with Mother Nature. It's also the social, the political, the cultural formations that come out of the, uh, the, in, the intentionality of how we relate to each other and how we relate to each other on the land and with the land. Everything is interconnected. And that, and that cognizance of the, um, everything being interconnected is what holds everything together. And so farmer to farmer solidarity is really, really important, um, not just within the, the framework of the brigades, but within agroecology more broadly, because we learn best when we're learning from one another, because we can share stories, we can share seeds, we can share tools, et cetera. So as farmers and builders, being in solidarity with one another, we were able to materially transform the landscape as we see here, like complete transformations, the before and after photos, where we reconstructed a greenhouse, we completely cleared a field for planting. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, us literally doing everything together. We had a whole tent city, we lived together, we cooked together, we cleaned together. Um, sort of like this village mentality, this village methodology where everyone's needs are met by everyone putting forth the work needed to get the work done. Um, and the collective work was organized around technical skill building, political consciousness raising, critical dialogue, and shared reflection. And let's see, as part of the, the technical piece, the geopolitical learning and knowledge exchanges are important because place-based realities are really what inform um, where the knowledge comes from and how the knowledge is exchanged. So for example, um, rebuilding with recycled telephone poles is a common tactic in the Caribbean and the Puerto Rican islands. And for St. Croix farmers, um, the Puerto Rican farmers were able to share how um, they build, they build with recycled telephone poles in St. Croix. And that's really important because the position of the nails is um, really impacts whether the nails will remain in place in, in terms of a hurricane. So as climate change continues to be central to farmers' lives, especially in the Caribbean, how to position nails or drill nails into a pole is a big deal. And so as a result of that, um, St. Croix and Puerto Rican uh, Farmer Knowledge Exchange, they're now talking about doing farmer trainings around how to reconstruct 
after in the aftermath of a hurricane because that Caribbean agroecological knowledge is really important and it's important for them to be to share with one another from Caribbean farmer to Caribbean farmer. And as for the political piece and the shared reflection and critical dialogue piece, reflection circles were really, really important because they're, they act as safe spaces to share experiences and emotions with the group. Um, as you can imagine, um, this, this work is really emotional. Um, a, friend of, a good friend of mine says that this work is emotional because Mother Earth is an emotional being, so innately um, we get really emotional doing this work. And so critical dialogues were needed to work through interpersonal challenges, um, conversations such as race, gender, sexuality, um, dynamics played a huge role in keeping the, the whole process afloat. And ceremony was also a really important way to spiritually ground us on the land. Um, knowing the history of the land we were working on in solidarity with the Boricua farmers uh, was important because the land works on us as we work on it. And the meaning we gather from the work heightens when we learn the history and the stories of the land. It's not just about working the land again, it's about being connected um, and building community with the people on the land and the stories are really a crucial part of that. And uh, let's see, do I have time to share a story? Yeah, I wanted to share a story um, that really moved me working um, at Finca Consentia in Vieques, Puerto Rico. Finca Consentia is a six acre fruit and vegetable farm and it was named after Monte Carmelo, an activist and beekeeper who strategically used bees to fight the land, the historical land occupations um, of the US military by positioning the bees in concealed boxes. And when the uh, US military invaded the homes, the bees would swarm the soldiers. And that was a way to um, resist the occupation um, that the US military was engaging in in Vieques. And so these are the stories that we heard um, while working the land. And that was really, really impactful for many of us because again, the stories and the land are connected. And so that it, it really contributed to our, our holistic understanding. And we be really believe as like campesinos or peasants that the technical skills that we get in working the land mean nothing without the cultural context. Everything is contextualized culturally, politically, and socially. And I will end with uh, a quick recap. So in terms of the Agroecological Solidarity Brigade pedagogy that unfolded, um, there were a few main components that I'll reiterate. It was meaningful work, farmer to farmer solidarity, critical dialogue, shared reflection, ceremony, horizontal communication, and participant preparation and knowledge mapping. Um, do I have time to go into the last two that I didn't really explain? You've got about a minute, Shakara. Okay, awesome. So participant preparation is really important because for many of us living here on, on Turtle Island or in the US, we are extremely privileged. And so it was really important for us to prepare ourselves mentally, physically, emotionally to work in solidarity with people who have lost everything. Um, not just their farms, but their whole lives, um, their, their homes completely destroyed, um, undrinkable water, without electricity. And so it can be a complete paradigm shift for many of us who are used to having basic necessities to live with. So participant preparation is really, really important, especially learning the, the political context, learning the history of the land, as I mentioned already. Um, the colonial occupation of Puerto Rico was really important to know prior and also knowledge mapping, knowing the needs and the assets of the people that are coming, um, that you're coming to work with is really, really important. So what do you have to contribute as an individual? Um, what, are your, what are your areas of growth as an individual that you can grow upon as you're doing the work? And so being really cognizant of yourself and the group that you're working with and the work that you're doing all really come into play um, pivotally. And I think those were the key learning points that I wanted to touch on. Thank you. Thanks, Shakara. If you can just take down your screen share, I'm going to pull up some slides and I believe it will go to Elizabeth. 
All right. Um, if you can help me put up my slides, because I am not good at this. <laughs> um, so, so, buenas tardes, mi gente. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Yampier, and I'm the executive director of Uprose here in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we're a frontline, grassroots, women of color led intergenerational organization that was founded by Puerto Ricans in 1966. I'm also co chair of the steering committee of the Climate Justice Alliance, which I'm honored to serve with. Uh, these amazing people. Um, I'm really happy today to talk a little bit about the Puerto Rican diaspora response. Um, and before I do that, I, you know, our initiative in New York is called Our, our Power PR NYC. Um, really important for everyone to understand that there's about 4 million of us outside of Puerto Rico and that the diaspora is largely made up of the descendants of extraction and of forced migration created by U.S. government to make room for U.S. economic and military interests. That's how we ended up uh, here in the United States. And consequently, regardless of what generation we were born in, whether we're one generation or two out, uh, we are our identity is completely anchored in Puerto Rico, and, res and for many of us, that means also resisting U.S. imperialism in Puerto Rico. The diaspora has a long history of fighting for Puerto Rico, uh, from fighting uh, against human rights violations, environmental degradation like the pipelines in Puerto Rico, genocide like when they um, sterilize one-third of the island's women, um, fighting, getting arrested uh, to stop the bombing of Vieques, um, and more recently, the austerity policies of PROMESA, the usurious debt, the elimination um, of, of the debt and the dated Jones Act, uh, fighting also hedge funds and vulture capitalists. And then just more, more recently, uh, when the hurricane hit the, uh, the diaspora, galvanized in full effect. Uh, we had never seen that kind of coming together of people from different political camps, uh, all really sort of clamoring to find out how they could serve Puerto Rico in the best way possible. And so those of us who come from the climate justice movement had a very different perspective about how we approach this. And so we worked to create our Power PR NYC, you could go to the next slide, um, which really brought together about um, the next one, about 32 organizations all over New York City. And we had some big goals. Uh, part of it was uh, to educate the diaspora on climate justice and strengthen the social cohesion through a people to people recovery, uh, to sustain media attention so that the growing crisis in the aftermath remains invisible and to invest in a just transition to support the creation of local livable economies that would birth sovereignty and self-sufficiency. Uh, here, what you're looking at is a meeting of a lot of the uh, Puerto Rican uh, leadership throughout the city that came together in conversation and healing. It was a very painful time uh, where people were really uh, frustrated about what they could do for Puerto Rico um, and how they would be able to save their families there uh, on the island. There was an enormous amount of frustration. Uh, people all over the city were gathering materials and resources to send to Puerto Rico, and they had a really hard time uh, getting those materials there, uh, mostly because of the Jones Act. You heard Jesus talk about the Jones Act, which is really an obscure 1917 regulation that was actually passed in time to make Puerto Rican citizens in time for World War I. It requires that goods shipped from one American port to another be transported on a ship that is American built and owned and crewed by US citizens or permanent residents. That's really important because what it did, it prevented other countries that wanted to provide Puerto Rico with assistance from providing them with materials and resources so that they could be saved. So there's a say, saying in Puerto Rico, um, no ayuda ni deja que alguien te ayude. So they basically were saying, we are not going to help you, but we're not going to let anyone in the world help you either. So there was a lot of frustration and pain here in the United States as a result of that, because people were gathering everything that they could to try to help Puerto Rico. It's also important for folks to know that Puerto Ricans in New York City lag behind every single racial and ethnic group socioeconomically, including new immigrants, and that citizenship has not been a help to us in that regard. And so um, we're talking about people who have historically been economically devastated, stepping up to help their brothers and sisters on the island. So the Puerto Rican diaspora has played an amazing role uh, in showing up for Puerto Rico consistently over history. You go to the next slide. Um, we had uh, a number of actions. Um, we had a national day of action, which we launched with the Climate Justice Alliance so that there were actually actions 
all over the country. Uh, this was our attempt to really draw a lot of media attention to the devastation in Puerto Rico. We know, for example, that whenever anything happens, whether it's in Puerto Rico or, or Haiti, that it's in the news for a minute and then the media moves on to the next story. We wanted to make sure that we kept Puerto Rico in the media because we knew that this was a story that was going to continue, that the devastation wasn't a one day or one year thing. Uh, but what happened in Puerto Rico really not only affected the people and the ecosystem, but there were 20 and there are 23 super funds in Puerto Rico that were created as a result of US um, environmental abuses that a lot of the toxicity in the land and the air and in the soil was going to affect people and that we wouldn't know for years how many people would actually die as a result of this hurricane. So we wanted to make sure that we use direct action rallies and the media as a way of keeping Puerto Rico in the media. So this is one that we had a union square. Next slide. Next slide. Um, we also, uh, these are examples of the kinds of things that were happening through uh, our power PR NYC in New York City where people were identifying the things that folks on the island needed. Really important in understanding a just recovery is that you ask people what they need and not come in as, um, you know, as people that want to save other folks uh, with what you think are the solutions, but asking people, what do you need? Um, and so people in Puerto Rico told us specifically what they needed. And so we were able to develop tools to educate people on the ground so that they could provide them specifically what they were asking for. Um, for example, people were providing diesel generators. Puerto Rico leads in, the, leads in the world in the level of asthma. And so we needed to provide um, generators that were solar powered. Next slide. Um, we uh, asked Greenpeace uh, to uh, provide us with their shit. Um, the intention behind that was that, you know, Greenpeace had a reputation of violating the law for whales and for animals, and we wanted them to bring their ship into Puerto Rico. We actually wanted Greenpeace to violate the Jones Act. Uh, but what that would mean would be taking away um, the ship. And so that couldn't happen. But what it did was that it basically gave us the opportunity of having international attention on the Jones Act, on the fact that that ship couldn't bring in supplies and materials to Puerto Rico in a time of need. Next. Um, so we continued with the memes and you can go on to the next slide. Um, I, I do want to say that um, really important in terms of the arts and culture that we use graphic arts, that we had art builds, that we had Bombay Plena, that we use music, all of those different things that were artic artistic expressions of culture were not only important in terms of our healing, but they were also important in terms of community building. They were important in terms of educating our community and developing trust and creating the spaces where people could come together to, to build and to, be, and, and to learn about complex issues like the Jones Act, like Promesa, like the debt, like hedge funds. People came, came together around food, around music, and around paint and art. And so I, I want to make sure that I lift that artistic uh, piece because climate justice organizations like ours are often thought about within the context of policy, but policy comes out of the actual art and the actual building that happens on the ground. And so all of those things for us are interconnected. Um, a lot of discussion about the number of deaths. We won't know for a while how many people will have passed on as a result of Hurricane Maria. We know that the legacy of austerity and neglect has contributed not only to a situation that is contributing to that, but that Hurricane Maria exacerbated an already bad situation. We know also that the level of, of suicides as a result of Hurricane Maria went up about 55% and that that continues to happen. Um, in New York City, where we've had Sandy, uh, we know what it's like, uh, how, how our communities and frontline communities are impacted uh, by the impacts of climate change. And we know that bigger uh, and more recurrent extreme weather events are coming our way. So really important when you think about island folks like Puerto Rico, I think I have a minute, let me talk really fast. Uh, really important that, um, that we invest um, in what we call a just recovery and a just transition so that we put the resources in the hands of the folks that are most impacted. Also important in terms of understanding extraction is that people not use Puerto Rico as an opportunity to learn and to get educated and to build their resumes and to have an experience uh, because that is extractive too. 
um, that our behavior is an, is an example of capitalism and the way that we have been conditioned to really extract from people that are in positions uh, that are in a place of pain. The way to come into Puerto Rico and the way to come into any nation or any group of people that has been exposed to this kind of disaster as a result of colonialism is to ask, what do you need and how can I support? And the just to, the people to people just recovery is a model of that. And so what's happened on the ground among the Puerto Rican diaspora, I think is that there is now this understanding about the connection between colonialism and climate change, that they know that climate change is the angry child of a legacy of extraction in the global south. Thanks. Sorry, Elizabeth. I'm I missed I missed a lot of our slides. I'm not good at doing PowerPoints. I'm sorry no, about that. <laughs> Let me. Um, so what we're going to do, folks, is we're going to transo transition over to a Q and A, and I'm just going to put up on the screen um, where you can access the report online and some contact information um, if you want to get in touch with the CJA team or with the lab team. Um, as I do that, I should also have mentioned that we uh, advertise. This is a 75 minute uh, webinar, so we'll have um, just over 20 minutes for a good, robust question and answer session. And we do have several questions um, coming in from participants, which is great that I have a stack of. But just to kick things off, I think for many people on this webinar, this might be their very first time learning about the Just Recovery Framework and what this work really looks like in practice. And I just want to appreciate all of our speakers for your expertise and your willingness not only to share with us, but all the work that you all have done on the ground to make this work real out in the world. Um, so just by way of getting a discussion started, and we'll introduce uh, the other questions as we go, if someone wanted to take an immediate next step in terms of preparing their organization or community to participate in a just recovery effort, either in support of your work or to prepare their community, what are some concrete like immediate next steps that folks could take to really kind of get on um, like to get on this train and to be equipped to support this type of recovery versus more of a disaster capitalistic extractive post-disaster way of responding. <laughs> Anyone want to take that? So I was kind of hoping that Jesus would answer that question. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just quickly say that um, I think it's important to connect with the people in the front line in Puerto Rico and to not get in the way, not show up, not show up for selfies like they did in Katrina, but to say, go to their websites, find out what they need. Uh, if they're asking for resources, if they're asking for, asking for materials, if they want to come together to do some learning circles about issues that may be new or they want to find out what financing looks like or investments or things that are complicated to not assume that people in Puerto Rico don't have the answers and don't have the solutions. What they may not have are the resources and the investments. And so there's a lot of ways that folks can show up, but what they can do is helicopter in. They have to ask people in Puerto Rico specifically what is needed. And so there are a number of organizations that the Climate Justice Alliance works with, specifically Organización Boricua, and so it all starts with that question, what do you need and how can I support? Yeah, and I'll just step in real quick. Uh, it's difficult to like, we're all in different places with this like, um, like turns, but I'll just mention real quick um, within like uh, this just recovery process is um, how can you help, but also you can be part of this movement, right? And, uh, and uh, as we know, climate change is happening everywhere. So the importance of being organized uh, collectively through your community, through your organization is very important. And when we talk about just recovery, it's not the short term. It's not like, ah, we had a hurricane. Now we need to recover. This is a, a, a long process. And it has to do with just transition because it's, it, we, we, we are deconstructing a lot of these root causes and systemic causes. And, uh, and we need to do it uh, collectively. So in that sense, uh, we're, we're feeling uh, climate change uh, um, everywhere. So it is very important for us as individuals to be, um, to be involved in collective processes. And I'm pretty sure around your community, there are some and within the organizations that are participating here, uh, there is um, all the context um, in, in this um, workshop. Great. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on a tiny bit to what Jesus and Elizabeth are saying in that 
uh, don't wait for a disaster to happen to build the network of solidarity and relationship that you need to respond when the disaster happens in your community. Because it's not a question of if at this point in our, you know, wherever you live, there is something that will be striking. And so, you know, in order to respond to the disaster capitalist who will be at the ready to have those networks in place, because it only accelerates the privatization and, you know, the extraction that is surely already happening. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and I just really appreciate the emphasis that so many of you put on the cultural aspect of this work, which is really when we look at the research on resilience, really where a lot of resilient capacity comes in is actually through connections, um, people to people, and that's really highlighted in the case study report. So I encourage people to dig into those materials because there's a wealth of resources, um, insights, recommendations in the multimedia report that's available online as well. Turning over to some of the questions that we got from participants, um, how do you see agroecology growing spatially and economically for a diverse regenerative economy? And there's a couple nested questions here. So um, I'll just introduce those, but it might, it's a kind of big question. Um, so how do you see agroecology coming into and impacting urban Boricuas and what role can local governments play in this transition? This is a question from Dylan. Okay, I'll say a little and, and, and I hope Shakira also steps in. Um, um, so yeah, um, so yeah, agroecology within the talk within of the Green New Deal. So um, if these, uh, if the Green New Deal is talking about sustainability, right, how can we correct all of these problems, then definitely the Green New Deal should involve uh, uh, and, and support an agroecological process. And, uh, and we know agro industry is there. We know agro industry is not even feeding the world. 70% of the food produced in the world is produced by small farmers and small peasants, right? So uh, within a Green New Deal, we would need um, um, in the Green New Deal uh, uh, anything that supports this model. Farmers and peasants, farm workers are working uh, through agroecological practices with their heart on their hands. It's not supported by institutions. It's not supported by, by the government. So in this sense, we would need to create and, uh, that infrastructure and that infrastructure will have to center uh, farmers, peasants, farm workers, food sovereignty activists, because this is, a, this is it, it, it's like a indigenous, right? We have this climate uh, crisis and the indigenous are the, the, the most that protect the biodiversity of the world and they're feeling it the same as also um, Afro descent communities, Latino communities, global South communities, farmers and peasants are feeding the world and they're also being uh, killed even to access uh, to in the battle to access land. So in that sense, we need more public policy. We need more infrastructure to really support uh, a, a model of agriculture that is, that is, com that is come from the community and that can, feed, that can feed and cool the world. Mm -hmm. And I thank you, Jesus, and I'll add that as farmers, small farmers feed the world, they do it with ancestral knowledge. So agroecology isn't something new. This is like a reclamation or regeneration or recovery of our ancestry, of how our ancestors worked the land. And so a, a really um, keen lens on what land work looks like has to be connected to the ancestry. I'll leave it there. Well. Thanks so much. And I will just make a quick correction that that question was from Desiree. And the question from Dylan is up next, which is, why would a decentralized disaster restoration approach be better? I could understand the importance of co-leadership across sectors, and it shouldn't be just government, but could, um, I think Dylan means Jesus elaborate more, please. But if other folks have, have thoughts on this question too, um, you're welcome to chime in. Pass it on to whoever wants. Be, uh, I've been talking so to have like some just distribution of, of participation here. Sure. Elizabeth or Joyisha, do you want to talk a little bit about why a decentralized disaster restoration approach? I, I mean, I, I think it's it's a you know, personally, my opinion is very much influenced by experience and the experience of our communities has been that the centralized approach does not uh, come to the aid of those who are, you know, the most marginalized, 
folks who are poor, undocumented, disabled, you know, all of the things that the centralized system will often um, not take into account or care. Um, and those are the folks that, you know, me personally, and I think a lot of the folks uh, on this uh, all the folks on this webinar for sure, but I'm hoping all the folks who are also participants on this webinar are caring to make sure when we are facing disaster are taken care of. And oftentimes centralized systems uh, go for the lowest common denominator, which will mean that uh, the most privileged. So that's like my short answer to that. I don't know if anyone else has more to add. So I, I, would, I would agree and say that um, everything that is bad becomes worse uh, after a disaster. There's more policing, more abuse, more, more of everything. Uh, we also assume that, um, that governance is going to work and that climate change doesn't disrupt governance. And so what we find, what we found in the Rockaways and what we found in Red Hook and what we found in different parts of New York that were affected by Sandy, was that the best, um, the, the ability to be able to save each other and to feed each other and to take each other out of harm's way came from people in, in, in the communities that, uh, that people were able in communities like Sunset Park that wasn't as affected, we were able to dispatch people to other communities that were, that it was that people to people just recovery in a decentralized system that made it possible for us to fend for ourselves in the moment of, ext of extreme danger. And so if you've got communities that are that that where it won't get there or communities that have been prioritized and others haven't what people have to depend on is what they have the resources that are local and so um, we can assume that moving forward with recurrent extreme weather events that there will be a disruption of government and we know how, go how government has responded to us historically we know for example that uh, not just in New York, but in Puerto Rico, there was more um, military and more and more policing, and that that scared people and affected them. So I think I think that this decentralized way of taking care of each other um, really is about local uh, systems that make it possible for people to survive um, and and and, uh, and to take care of each other in a time of need. Uh, and that, that's actually going to happen not just in Puerto Rico, but it's happening literally all over the place. Um, it is different because it's not top down and it's not grass tops. It's something that's coming from the ground. And I think that it challenges this sort of capitalist, a hierarchical way that people think about power and community resilience, right? Uh, but it is exactly what we need in a time that is changing and that is challenging systems that got us where we are. Yeah. Thank you both so much for speaking to that question. I think that's really important and one that I think in many cases we're less familiar with what that might look like, um, but the critical role of relationships and actually being able to identify where folks are and need to be um, helped when infrastructure goes down and where we don't necessarily have public systems that can account for all of those details. Like sometimes you just, you know, you know where your people are um, and that's, that becomes very important. Um, another really important question, which came from um, Rona, which is curiosity about where funding came from or comes from for these just recovery efforts. And I know we heard a little bit of a response to that in the chat, but I would like to open up that conversation, obviously, in all of our work as advocates or activists or organizers or just in supporting our community. There are always resource constraints, so I'd love to hear, yeah, where funding came from or other types of support, um, how you might have innovated around that. Who'd like to take that question? I will briefly answer that and I hope folks can chime in. Um, certainly um, people in the Puerto Rican diaspora pull their resources uh, to support folks uh, on the ground in Puerto Rico, uh, but foundations also really stepped up and our philosophy and our thinking behind it was that we really needed to move the money to the people most impacted and the people doing the work in Puerto Rico, that we needed to work to build their capacity to access those resources, uh, but that we didn't want to control how they spent them and we didn't want to tell them what their priorities were. We really wanted to just facilitate um, that access. And so I think that uh, the Climate Justice Alliance played a role in um, not only briefing uh, foundations, and there were quite a few of them, uh, but making the connections between foundations that might not have a historical relationship with the front line in Puerto Rico to make that happen. Thanks, Elizabeth. Anyone else wanna respond to the question about funding? 
Um, I put this in the chat, but I mean, we we didn't have funding to to particularly when Harvey was happening to put up our page. The intention was actually to make sure and redirect people's individual giving away from the Red Cross and towards grassroots groups like Tejas and others that we knew were actually providing resources on the ground. So that was actually like our intention was not money for us. We didn't make a single cent from the 200,000 hits that our page took. You know, our intention was to ensure that resources got to the ground to the people who needed it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Toisha. I want to go to a question that Elise raised actually and just open it up a little bit. So Elise mentioned that um, they will have about 100 people headed to Puerto Rico in March and are interested in a day of service learning. Um, so I was interested in connecting with Jesus, but I did just want to kind of ask the broader question as we think about the ongoing recovery efforts and just transition, as folks mentioned, what are the best ways for folks to continue supporting Puerto Rico, especially folks will be there in person or if folks are thinking about how they might expand um, resilience work that's happening or advocacy that's happening, just kind of want to open up that question. Obviously, there's one part of this conversation that is what might just recovery and just transition look like in your community. And then there might be this other part of like, how can we support these ongoing efforts, particularly given the fact that there is a continued need in Puerto Rico and the need to keep attention on communities that have been impacted as they go through long-term recovery processes. So yeah, I mean, um, I, I put a little bit of uh, uh, like a contact information of the organization and also my contact information for those of you interested or that are visiting Puerto Rico or that know how, want to know how can they can just participate in activities or support in any way. So feel free to, to contact us. And, uh, and we'll be gladly to, to, to help and, 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 and to keep this work going. Um, I would also encourage you within that question, especially for, for, for people living in the US, to learn about Puerto Rico. I think it is um, a responsibility, um, and all, especially within the context that we live. We have, uh, we have a US uh, federal law applies to Puerto Rico, even though we don't have a voice in Congress. Uh, U.S. president's uh, decisions affect Puerto Rico, even though we don't have the right to vote for him. So I think um, anything you can do in order to learn about what's happening in Puerto Rico, if you want to get to know Puerto Rico, if you're interested in, in, in the, these struggles and these uh, um, um, organizing processes that were involved here, feel free to contact. There are other many uh, great organizations and, uh, and communities that have been um, struggling against the extraction, uh, organizing, uh, provide, organizing for uh, just um, um, housing, uh, among others, the fisher folk, um, et cetera, the, the many people doing uh, organizing, mobilizing, et cetera. So yeah, just um, um, contact us. We'll be happy to, to also send uh, links from other organizations and materials, but, um, and, uh, and yeah, and, 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 and happy to get involved. I just want to add that uh, this is probably a time in our life when we really need to start thinking about service differently uh, and not recreating contemporary missionaries. Um, you know, people think about service, but they're also thinking about how that makes them feel. And I remember when I was living, leaving Puerto Rico and I was in the airport seeing some students coming from State University of New York and thinking, uh, instead of sending students from uh, the University of New York to help Puerto Rico, what about raising the funds to make it possible for the students that are at the University of Puerto Rico, not only to stay in school, but to be able to re rebuild their own communities. That may not feel as good, but that is the way that you support a people to people just recovery. Um, and so I, 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 would, I would caution and, and urge people to start thinking differently about what service means. And, and service really means, means supporting autonomy, sovereignty, and making it possible for people to speak for themselves, build for themselves. That's the kind of service that this time that we're living in requires. It doesn't feel as good, but we really need to move away from those past ways of thinking because the missionary mentality was one that's built on colonialism and it's one that's extractive and doesn't really do what you are supposed to be doing, which is using your time and your resources and your power to leave something better than it was before uh, and, not, and not feel good at the expense of the struggle that someone else is going through. So I know that sounds a little harsh to some people and it's new, 
But I, I think that we really need to start thinking differently about what service means and how we redefine that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I, I really appreciate teasing out that nuance. And it reminds me of what you said earlier, that the questions to ask when we're trying to support a community post, post-disaster, but also in general, what do you need and how can I support not like I'm going to go and do the support that I think is helpful or that I think will make me feel good. Um, so flipping that script, I think is really important. We've got a really great question from Maddie here that's teed up, uh, but I just want to flag, we're going to be wrapping up in three minutes. So if you have any other questions that you want to share with us in the chat box, now is the time. Um, and I'm going to drop in a link for a very brief feedback survey if folks are willing to take even 60 seconds right now to complete three questions. We'd really appreciate your feedback on this for our own continued learning and development and our ability to continue providing programming and uh, conversations that are enriching and helpful to your work. So with that said, Maddie asks, what does it look like to be a good community leader and cultural influencer in a community where there aren't really any strong community bonds or roots yet? And I know that each of you has uh, experience in this. So I'd love to maybe just do a quick round robin where each of you shares one or two thoughts on how to be a good community leader and cultural influencer when the roots are, and connections aren't super strong yet. Who would like to go first? Maybe Shakira, we haven't heard your voice in a minute. Sure. Um, I'll keep it brief. I think showing up and um, shutting up really, really does a lot. Ask more questions and be, a, and as Elizabeth said, be of service, ask questions. What can you do to support? And don't think that you have the answers coming in, especially when the relationships and the trust isn't there for you um, to impose whatever knowledge you think may be valuable. But definitely showing up and asking questions is, is definitely like the baseline in my experience. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to speak to that? With the danger of having spoken too much, I do have to say something about this. Um, I, I just think that um, we define leadership in, in very extractive ways. And, and the truth is that um, we need to redefine it. Leadership manifests in a lot of different ways and not always by the person who's at the mic, but the people who are actually doing the work on the ground. And that we need to move away from leadership to thinking leaderful. Um, how, what, that, what does it look like to bring a collective of people together that exercise leadership in a lot of different ways because the truth is that the person who's at the mic or the person that you see all the time is not able to do anything without all of these different pieces and all of these different people who are actually holding up all of the work. And so I think we need to start thinking in terms of collectives and what leaderful means. Um, and I think that we need to start moving away from traditional ways of thinking about how we define leadership. Um, in, it's a real danger. You know, we saw that with the climate strikes where people select a leader for us and that leader is supported by an international media machine and they decide that that's the person who speaks for a movement. When all over our communities, all over the United States, we have folks that are holding that work and, and the real story and the real powerful story and the real transformation happens uh, in being part of leader leaderful communities. I can't even imagine a community where those connections don't exist. They exist in community everywhere. I don't know, I've never been in a community where those connections and those deep roots don't exist. It could be the bodega owner who has everybody coming through and knows everybody's problems and knows how to resolve them. Or the person who owns the laundromat who has ladies walking through their women all the time and, and it becomes a community center. Uh, people think that those solutions, those things happen in institutions, but they happen on the block, at least that that's the case in New York City, and they happen in different places in a lot of different ways. And, and that's where, uh, and, and so I, I, I just, I mean, I don't want to uh, go too far. But anyway, I just, I just think that we need to be leaderful. Thanks, yeah. Elizabeth. I'll, I'll, I'll just say, I'll just, I'll, sorry, I we just want to write it time. Um, so I just want to be mindful, um, Jaisha, maybe like one breath um, in your comment, and then I'll turn it over to Jesus, who is going to close us with some inspiring closing words. 
my breath is yes. I my there is definitely leaders in your community. It might not be the people you are thinking are leaders. And I'll close with Chokwe uh, Lumumba's words: If you don't love the people, you'll eventually betray the people. So in order to love the people, do your research. Cool. Thanks. Okay, so we're officially ending this and uh, as um, as organization and as organizers, we also uh, uh, value a lot the grounding space, uh, a space that this is not just, you know, people talking, we're in a virtual model here, but that really we go um, holding our feelings and our intentions. We normally sit in a circle, we normally look at each other's eyes and faces and we talk to each other and we have a, a balanced way of of doing these things, uh, but I wanted to to end up. Uh, we wanted to end up um, um, just um, um, recognizing um, as within the work that we do in Organización Boricua, we we talk a lot about uh, the seed, right? About the mother seed. Uh, we're tiny seeds representing the struggles that we are doing all in our countries at the at the local level, at the regional level at the continental level and at the, in, and the global level, right? And, uh, and uh, for us, we protect those seeds, we share those seeds of our, as our ancestors did for centuries before all of these systems that oppress us uh, were put into place by people that don't represent us. But also those seeds are the processes and the work that we've been doing. And I just wrote down some of the words that we heard during this workshop and I just want to share them with them. So we, we talked about people to people. We talked about justice and we the justice in, in recovery, justice in, in, in a transition that truly represents us, justice in, in, in the work that we do within the environment. We talked about food sovereignty, producing food by ourselves. We talked about mutual support. Uh, you're helping me, but I'm helping you. It's not, it's, it's, it goes both ways. We talked about decentralize, and by decentralizing the work, we're building power. We talked about the importance of organization. We need to be organized. These systems are organized, and that's the only way that we can prevail. We talked about real solutions, real people solutions. We, had, we have a long-term vision, and we encourage everyone to, to, to hold on to a long-term vision. And finally, uh, we know that doing all of this work, we're parting away, we're deconstructing a model, an economical model that uh, extracts from Mother Nature as if, as if there was no limit and also exploit human beings, exploits uh, nature in general, animals. So we leave you on that thought. We encourage you to, to support uh, in, any, in, in, in any way uh, that you can and also to get involved uh, at, at your local level and also with all of these um, um, aspects of the struggle that we have shared. And we're more than happy to continue the conversation um, when we have more time. And I'll Thank pass you. it on to Lucia now. Thank you so much, Jesus, and to Elizabeth and Shakira and Jaisha and Angela and uh, Jesus. And I'm just going to keep thanking all of you in a circle. Um, the report, as mentioned earlier, is available online. And we just really appreciate all of the work that you all are doing. Uh, I always want to appreciate everyone who joined us for today's conversation with the, rem with the remembrance that there are a lot of demands on your time in a lot of different places that you could be, but you chose to be here with us today to learn about this work and to learn about how we can support communities that are impacted by climate disasters in a just and equitable way. And we really appreciate your being with, here with us today. Um, contact us, info at climateadvocacylab.org for any info about the lab if you want to be a member. The report is also available online on our webpage, um, but also holly at climatejusticealliance.org if you want to find contacts to any of our speakers. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us, and we will catch you next time. <laughs>